that in returning and in resting we shall be saved, and in quietness and in confidence we shall be strengthened. We see the constancy and immutability of God's word and his assurance because we know that he cannot lie. Is someone crying out in our congregation this morning to be rescued? Rescued from an illness. Rescued from an addiction. Rescued from a private demon. Rescued from a childhood scar. Rescued from the reality of what's next or the fear of what's next. Rescued from the strain and the stress of unanswered prayer. Does someone here this morning need to be rescued like Hagar was rescued? I guarantee you that you can find the rescue that you so desperately seek in making an intentional decision to return and rest. Amen. To return and rest. Amen. Our second account this morning, the account that's another familiar account of the good Samaritan, of, of the woman of Samaria, pardon me, emphasizes the second characteristic of returning and resting. And that is to restore. In returning and in resting, Christ seeks to restore us back to himself. Amen. You know, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. When the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt in the days of Ezra, the Samaritans wanted to join the Jews in rebuilding the temple, but the Jews would not allow them. Thus, the place of worship and where it should be located became an ongoing source of contention, and a bitter animosity existed and developed between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans ended up building this rival temple in Mount Jerusalem, where they worshipped, and they too became involved in idolatry. And as a result, the Samaritans suffered, and you can read this in great controversy, in um, a desire of ages, one disaster after the next including the destruction of the temple that they had built in Mount Jerusalem. Yet this bitter animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans would not allow the Samaritans to even worship in the Jewish temple. They had lost their temple, but the Jews would not allow them to worship in the Jewish temple. Centuries later, brothers and sisters, during the time of Jesus, this rivalry only became worse. The two groups, the Jews and the Samaritans, tried to avoid each other. They tried to avoid dealing with each other. This becomes the backdrop for this life-changing encounter that Jesus has with this Samaritan woman. You see, Jesus and his disciples had left Judea, and they were traveling north all morning through the scorching heat of the noonday sun. And as they neared Samaria, the disciples separated to get some food, and Jesus continued on. But by this time, Jesus himself also was hungry, and he was thirsty. And his, his thirst naturally increased as he approached a well, Jacob's well. But as he reached it, he realized that he didn't have anything with which to draw some water. And it's right at this point that this woman of Samaria comes up to fetch water from the well. I need to say something here, that, and that is that in, in Eastern customs, water was seen as a gift from God. To offer water to a thirsty traveler was held in very high regard. Arabs of the deserts would go out of their way to bring relief to thirsty travelers. But the intense hatred, we talked about earlier, between the Jews and the Samaritans prevented the woman from offering water to this stranger, Jesus. Ellen White records this encounter in the Diary of Ages, and she says this, and I quote, with the tact that only the divine love could devise, Jesus asks the woman a favor, unquote. You know, the one who owns every stream and every spring, every river and every sea, every lake and every ocean, he rested from his weariness and he descended, or depended, I should say, upon the kindness of a stranger enemy, asking her for a drink of water. 
You know, we know that the master wasn't just seeking. He was thirsty, he was human. And divine. He was thirsty, yes. But he was seeking more than that. He was seeking the key to this woman's heart. Her curiosity, as a result of this question, was awakened by this enemy, a Jew, who dared to talk to her. The woman realized that Jew Jesus was a Jew, and forgetting to give him the water, she asks, how come you, being a Jew, asks me, a Samaritan woman, for water? We find that account in John chapter 4, verse 9. Jesus' Jesus's response says, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Amen? Amen. Jesus asks this woman to rest her faith in him. If she did this, she would receive her heart's the de desire, which really was the desire of all ages. Amen. What she had been searching for all her life, but had not found in any man or person. He would restore her and give her soul peace and rest. In this brief conversation with this woman, Jesus sought to break down the prejudices of the Samaritans against the Jews and vice versa. He told her that a time was soon to come when neither groups would worship either in the mountain, the sacred mountain, or in the sacred temples. Jesus said to her, there was coming a time when all true worshipers would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, the very Samaritan people had drifted from the Lord and from the Jewish nation. And Jesus was now here in Samaria on an intentional visit to restore the Samaritans back to their Jewish brothers and sisters and to himself. Amen. Oh, what love beyond measure. Amen. Amen. Captured by the attention Jesus paid to her, the Samaritan woman trusted the truth of what she now learned. She hadn't realized that by coming to the well and meeting Jesus, that she was actually being used to prepare the way for an entire town Amen. to meet the desire of all ages, for an entire enemy state to come to know a God of limitless love. Her life was changed, yet her restoration was not complete, brothers and sisters, until she returned to the village and shared what Jesus had given her giving her the special gift of the water of life. And yes, when she returns, she is a different person. Jesus had made his way to the well because he was thirsty, but he had a more important purpose to accomplish. He wanted to restore a people who had drifted from the Lord and from their heritage. And he, wants to, he wanted to inform them and us today that religion, that worship, that religion and worship mm. are not confined to the externals. Mm. Instead, worship comes from God and must always lead to God. Amen. Every day, brothers and sisters, through various avenues, Christ seeks to rescue us and to restore us, to restore us back to him. The final example this morning is another woman we know so well in the Bible, Mary. Returning and resting, but that's not all. Jesus desires to do something more in us. He desires, brothers and sisters, to renew us as women and as men so that we can fully experience his immeasurable love. What a turn her life took after she met Jesus. She had been misused by a member of one of the religious leaders, a Pharisee. She was emotionally strung out and mentally destabilized. So much so that she had been labeled the woman with seven demons. As Lazarus' sister, she had sat <laughs> and listened intently to the teachings of Jesus as he stopped by their home and fellowship with them. She had learned so much from his teaching 
that she was eager to express her gratitude and her love for Jesus in a very special way. We find the backdrop in Mark, Mark chapter 14. A group had now gathered at Simon's house for a feast just before the Passover. Simon was the host. He had opened up his home. This is the Simon whom Jesus had healed of leprosy. And crowds, imagine that with me, had anxiously followed Jesus on his way to Bethany. Excitement was still strong as they pressed to just get a glimpse of this Lazarus guy, this man who Jesus had just raised from the dead. <coughs> Some wanted to know about the thrill of life after death. Some followed with evil intention because they wanted to get to Jesus. And others followed because they wanted to remove any evidence that Jesus could raise anyone from the dead. I think that many were there too for a different reason. But Mary, Mary was there for a different reason. She had had some lingering issues. But now that she had found Jesus, her soul, had found a resting place. Amen. Jesus had forgiven her of her sins. He had raised her brother Lazarus. She was grateful for that, but her relief and her appreciation was overshadowed with grief because he knew that, she knew that he, Jesus, was soon to die. And so she purchased a box of expensive ointment of spikenard with most of her earnings. This must be the time, she thought. It is either now or never. So amidst the talk and the throngs and the, the chatter at the feast, she slid through the crowd and parted pressed bodies into the, into the circle where she could be close to her Savior. And with the spikenard ointment, she planned to anoint the body of Jesus before his death in preparation for his burial. But with the excitement in the village and in the room, many talked about something totally different. Many talked about crowning Jesus as king. Now Mary is confused and in, in the burst of confusion and joy, she quietly breaks the box of ointment and pours the spike now over the head of Jesus. And then with her hair and with her tears, she wiped his feet. She had hoped that no one had noticed her act. Even though her generous and extreme action may not have been noticed by many who were clamoring for Jesus' attention, the sweet smell and aroma could not be ignored and it permeated the room. But then, very quickly, the rebuke came swiftly. This level of waste could not be tolerated, not when there was such great need in the community. You know, Judas was offended by this waste and extravagance. Never mind that as treasurer for the disciples, Judas had frequently taken funds from the treasury for personal use. This ointment, Judas explains and announces, could not be sold or could have been sold, and the funds could have been given to the poor. <coughs> what a contrast, brothers and sisters. What a contrast. <coughs> this act of seeming extravagance stands in direct contrast to Judas's self-serving attitude. He, Judas, was not concerned about the poor, but looked out only you can imagine the embarrassment Mary felt that she was put up in front street. She was already a lady of low reputation. Now all attention seems turned to her. How I think she must have wanted to just disappear and evaporate. But <laughs> did we talk about Jesus coming to the rescue earlier? It was just at this time that Jesus, who had been observing everything, spoke up. He noticed that Mary 
felt humiliated and embarrassed at the rebuke and at the disdain of Judas and some of the other disciples. She had been bowed down low. Mary, she had been down that road before as a victim of sexual abuse. She had lived a life of guilt and rejection. But she still kept a glimmer of hope in her heart. Hope that she could be rescued. Hope that she could have been restored. And hope that she would be renewed. Oh, how many times, brothers and sisters, has Jesus renewed the fragments of your broken hearts? How many times has he restored your life, a life torn apart by disappointment and setback and betrayal and anger and guilt? How many times? Yet as the songwriter says, he'll do it again Amen. and again. Amen. Just take a look at where you are now Amen. and where you have been. Yeah. Hasn't he always He's the same now as We may not know how. We may not know when. But I'm sure as we're sitting here, he'll do it again. Amen. Oh, don't you just love it when Jesus has his say. He told them to leave. Leave. Don't bother her, he says in Mark chapter 14, verse 6. You see, the other disciples had joined in their criticism of Mary's wasteful display. And chief among those disciples, what could you guess? It was Simon. Simon, the host of the occasion. Simon, who had been influenced by Judas' criticism and had thought to himself, you know, if Jesus was really a prophet, he would have known that this woman who was standing right next to him, who even touched him, was a sinner. I mean, a really bad sinner. <laughs> you see, brothers and sisters, Simon had forgotten that he too had experienced the healing touch of Jesus. You see, he, Simon, had been a leper and he had been cleansed. Not only that, Simon had been the one who had defiled this Mary. But now that his terrible act was forgiven, he dared to accuse the woman whom he had run. run. How quickly Simon forgot where God had brought him from. How easily he sought to accuse when his own past was filthy and corrupt. Isaiah Vages tells us that how little Simon appreciated the mercy he had received from the Savior. Mm -hmm. He was a sinner who had been pardoned, Mr. Swite says, yet he was a sinner unpardoned. Mm -hmm. As the host for this event, Simon had an opportunity to show his love for Jesus. He had provided no water for Jesus' dusty feet. No kiss of gratitude had Simon given for what Jesus had done for him. And as I studied for this message, I thought, I am like Simon. How often have I forgotten God's immeasurable love, his extravagance? We were created by love, in love, and for love. He wants us to talk about him and to sing about him and to tell about what he's done for us. Yeah. How he's kept us from losing our minds, even though we may have lost some of our worldly treasures. He wants us to talk about how he has kept us on the job, even as others were laid off. Not because we were any better. He wants us to talk about how he has brought back our estranged spouses and He's a God of second chances, and he's a God of third and fourth and fifth chances, and he's a God of sixth and seventh chances. Amen. Jesus had to remind Simon in a non-accusatory way. In Luke chapter 7, verse 47, 
Jesus tells Simon, Seest thou this woman? I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. But Mary didn't fully grasp the full impact of what she had done, this extreme act of love. She didn't know why she had done what she had done. But Jesus knew that through this act, she was expressing her extreme gratitude for his forgiveness of her sins. How many of us have been prompted by the Holy Spirit to go in a specific direction, to make a specific decision, to go against the grain of popular thought. The Holy Spirit, we are told in the Zion of Ages, page 560, speaks to the mind and to the soul. Praise God, it moves the heart to action. It serves as its own justification. I'm almost done. Through this act, Mary anointed the body of Jesus while he was still alive. Days later, women would, women would come to anoint his lifeless, cold body that had been taken down from a cross. But this woman, this sinner who had been renewed and who had been given a new lease on life by a compassionate and forgiving Savior, anointed him while he was still alive. She had done what had never been done before. Through this act, she showed that she understood his mission and grasped that this mission was soon to end. Not even his disciples, the ones closest to him, had understood this. Her desire to do this service for the Lord meant more to Christ than all the precious ointment in the world that led you white house. Amen. Christ pronounced that wherever the gospel is preached, Mark chapter 1 verse 9. Wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the love of God for a dying world is brought to the ears of mankind, wherever the matchless charms of Christ is talked about, this act, Christ says, this extravagant, immeasurable act of love, by this woman, Christ says, this act must be remembered, must be told for a memorial of mercy. This Mary Magdalene was renewed. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is in the repairing business. He wants more than anything else to repair a broken and defiled humanity and to make us whole again. Hagar was rescued. The woman of Samaria was restored and Mary Magdalene was renewed. Their journeys are much like our journeys today. Millennia apart, yes. Different cultures, yes. But the experiences are similar, and the call is the same. And much like Isaiah's appeal to the children of Judea, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. So is the appeal of May 10th, 2014. It is still the same, return and rest, so that you can be rescued. Return and rest so that I can be restored. Return and rest so that we can be renewed as men of God, as women of God. We can experience this love beyond measure. And when we say yes, yes, I'm ready to be rescued, and yes, I'm ready to be restored, and yes, I'm ready to be renewed, Christ will take it from there. Brothers and sisters, the imminent return